A nuclear reactor is considered the peak of modern engineering, but did you know that a reactor can occur naturally? And that one did occur naturally in Africa over a billion years ago? Hey everybody, I'm Jim, and if you're new here, I'm a nuclear engineer with over 20 years of experience maintaining, testing, and operating nuclear reactors. In 1972, scientists studying samples from the Oklo Uranium Mining Facility in the African country of Gabon noticed something odd. Natural uranium deposits should have 99.27% uranium-238 and 0.72% U-235, but these samples had less U-235 than was expected. Some of the samples showed as little as 0.44%. Now, further sampling showed that the uranium mine only contained an average of about 0.717% U-235. That may sound like a small discrepancy, but that's about 200 kilograms of missing uranium-235 from this mine. And further investigation found levels of specific isotopes of xenon, neodymium, and ruthenium that were higher than they should be. These isotopes are common products of the fissioning of uranium. Physicists concluded that, in the distant past, the conditions must have existed for sustained nuclear fission. So how could this have happened? There are three things that needed to happen at this time for this natural reactor to have occurred. First, a sufficiently large amount of uranium must have been deposited to create a mass capable of undergoing a sustained critical reaction. Second, a neutron moderator, in this case water, must have been present in order to slow down the neutrons in order to increase the chance of fission reactions occurring. And third, a sufficient percentage of U-235 must exist in the uranium deposit. So let's look at these one at a time. In order for a large enough uranium deposit to have formed, it must have become mobile. In this case, it must have been dissolved in water in the area and then subsequently concentrated as uranium deposits in the area. And this was not possible until 2.4 billion years ago. Uranium doesn't readily dissolve in water unless there's enough dissolved oxygen in that water. And until about 2.4 billion years ago, there wasn't enough oxygen to do that. There was only about 1 or 2% oxygen in the Earth's atmosphere at the time. However, with the evolution of cyanobacteria at the time, which utilizes photosynthesis to make energy and then release oxygen, there was a large increase in oxygen levels in the atmosphere, which led to higher levels of dissolved oxygen in the water. This was what allowed the uranium deposit to be able to form in the Earth in sufficient size and purity for a sustained fission reaction to have occurred. And in case you didn't know what fission is, fission occurs when a neutron is absorbed by the nucleus of an atom, in this case U-235, and causes that atom to become unstable. This atom then splits, releasing fission products, a significant amount of energy, and most importantly, two to three neutrons. Now this is important because these neutrons can then go on to cause more fissions. In a nuclear reactor, this is a controlled process that results in a safe, stable reaction rate to produce consistent power output. Now, nuclear reactors are all about the probability of interactions, and we choose materials to increase or decrease those probabilities. In order to increase the probability of fissions, neutron moderators and reflectors are utilized. That's where the second ingredient to this natural reactor comes in, water. In the case of the natural reactors at Oklo, water provided both of these actions. When a neutron is born from a fission, it has a relatively high energy level. These newly released neutrons are called fast neutrons. This high energy level makes it less likely for it to interact with U-235, causing another fission, and makes it more likely to just leave the core altogether. So in order to increase the odds of fissioning, these neutrons must be slowed down. These lower energy neutrons are referred to as thermal neutrons. This is done by providing a medium for the neutron to interact with, called a moderator. Now water makes an excellent moderator for neutrons because the nucleus of a hydrogen atom is just one neutron, and water has two hydrogen atoms for every molecule. So when a high energy neutron collides with a hydrogen atom in the water, it imparts half of its energy, roughly, to the water molecule. This is most efficient when particles are of equal mass. Picture a billiard ball bouncing off of another billiard ball versus what would happen if you bounced a billiard ball off of a bowling ball where it would bounce right back at you with very little energy loss. Now this water also has an added benefit of reflecting neutrons back into the uranium deposit. As lower energy neutrons reflect back into the uranium deposit, it increases the neutron inventory available for fission. Now the third condition that must have existed for this natural reactor to have occurred is that there had to have been a sufficient percentage of uranium-235 in the uranium deposit. At our current percentage of 0.72%, this just isn't possible. That is why for a normal nuclear reactor that we have currently, we have to enrich the fuel to increase the percentage of U-235. Most reactors operating now use fuel that's enriched between 3 and 5%. Now, 1.7 billion years ago, the percentage of U-235 was significantly higher. 
The half-life, or the amount of time it takes for a material to lose half of its current mass due to radiological decay, is about 700 million years. So for example, if I had 100 grams of uranium-235 with me right now, in 700 million years I would have 50 grams of uranium-235 and a pile of other elements from the decay of the uranium. Now the half-life of U-238 is significantly longer, at about 4.5 billion years. So the isotopic percentage of naturally occurring U-235 was significantly higher then because it decayed a lot faster, so it's lower now than it was then. In fact, when the Earth was formed, natural uranium was about 30% U-235. And at 1.7 billion years ago, when this reactor occurred, it was at about 3%, which is more than enough for a sustained fission reactor to occur in this uranium deposit. So, when all of these things occurred, high enough oxygen levels to dissolve uranium so that it could be concentrated into ore deposits, water to provide moderation, and a high enough percentage of U-235, we had a naturally occurring fission reactor. And this phenomenon was a cyclical one. As the fissioning process heated the water, it would boil away and no longer provide moderation, so the process would shut down. This is actually an inherent safety feature of a water-moderated reactor, like a pressurized water reactor or a boiling water reactor, where in the event of a loss of coolant, it loses moderation and the reactor actually shuts down. So then eventually, water would return and the process would begin again. There were about 30 minutes of criticality, the water would boil away, be about a two and a half hour cooling cycle, and the water would reflood and would start again. This three hour cycle went on for hundreds of thousands of years. This type of periodic energy discharge followed by a period of calm can be seen today in other natural phenomena like geysers or even volcanic activity. The average power output of this reactor was about 100 kilowatts, and it's estimated that about 5 tons of uranium-235 was fissioned over the span of these hundreds of thousands of years. So, what can we learn from this unusual place? Well, it gives us a natural analog to study the migration of fission products in the ground over an extremely long period of time allowing us to study geological fuel storage ideas. One of the most commonly studied ideas for long-term spent fuel storage is deep geologic burial. So even though these storage sites are carefully designed and engineered, the intent is that they would need to last for thousands of years, and having an understanding of how the spent uranium fuel from Oklo moved throughout the local geology over hundreds of millions of years provides a very interesting perspective. Now this is also a good example of how we continue to learn about the Earth as we improve our scientific knowledge over time. If this thing had been found 200 years ago, we would have no idea what happened here. So we had to study nuclear fission before we could understand what happened here. How many more amazing things are waiting to be discovered once we have a mental framework for understanding it? If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up, subscribe, and share on social media. It really helps with the algorithm. Thanks for watching.